Thank you for joining and welcome to another presentation in our series on One Health, presenting important zoonosis. We hope to explain with these presentations why protecting animal health and the environment ultimately protects us. Today, we will be talking about vector-borne disease examples. And my name is Dr. Isabel. I am the veterinarian at the Belize Wild FN Referral Clinic. With the One Health concept, we speak about the many different connections that they, there are between human health, animal health, and the environmental health. And the approach to One Health speaks to sometimes preventing the disease in the environment or in the animals to protect us. These tick-borne diseases that we are talking about today are certainly an example of that, where we protect our pets and therefore we protect ourselves. So we will be talking about ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. I will introduce briefly what is it, what is the causing agent, how common is this disease, what's the disease like in animals, uh, and in humans, how do we get the disease? How do we know we have it? And most importantly, how can we avoid getting this disease? All of us. A few general remarks first on tick fever and the link to the One Health approach here. So vector-borne diseases, first of all, are diseases that are transmitted between different species by vectors. These are not always ticks, uh, but there are different vectors. Today, we will focus, however, on just two diseases that are transmitted by ticks. They are very commonly found in uh, dogs and wildlife. Ticks, that is, so the prevalence of vectors is very high. The disease can be life-threatening for the animal host if it is not treated. And even in humans, uh, while infections are very rarely diagnosed and much smaller in numbers and in animals, they can be debilitating and even fatal. Globally, vector-borne diseases are on the rise. And the link to this One Health concept or the One Health approach here is that we can much more easily eliminate the disease vector, aka the ticks in the environment, and treat the animal host to prevent this disease risk for both animals as well as us um, as a host. So what are we talking about? The causing agent is a bacterium by the name of Ehrlichia and anaplasma. So we're actually talking about two diseases today that are not identical, but have a lot of similarities in that they both will affect many organ systems, but uh, crucially also different blood cells. The names for the disease uh, in animals, we often refer to it as just tick fever, uh, but specifically it's ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. And uh, in humans, the disease names are human monocytic ehrlichiosis or granulocytic anaplasmosis. There have been some changes to the names for simplicity. We will just talk about ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. Two uh, bacteria with different species and uh, different strains as well. So how common is this disease? It is spread worldwide. Here in Belize, we tested dogs at the BWRC and we found between 40 and 50% of them positive for Ehrlichia and 7 to 8% positive for Anaplasma. Looking at the prevalence in humans, this disease was first reported in the 1980s and it wasn't officially tracked until 2008. What you can see here with these numbers from the CDC in the US is though a strong increase from uh, 2000, where 
200 cases of ehrlichiosis and about 350 cases of anaplasmosis were reported in humans. And then 20, aka 19 years later, there was a tenfold increase in human cases in ehrlichiosis and in human anaplasmosis. 5,655 cases were reported to the CDC in 2019. So this disease is underdiagnosed because it is hard to find and rarely suspected, but it is clearly on the rise. Here is just another uh, statistic from just Maine that was, but again, you can see uh, one case reported in 2003 and in 2013, there were 92. What does this disease look like in animals? It's called often tick fever. It can show no signs. It can show mild signs and it can be very severe to deadly. It takes several days to weeks to sometimes months from the actual bite to uh, life-threatening symptoms after months, that is. Often at first, uh, fever and lack of appetite is the only thing that appears briefly and the symptoms are very varied. So it goes from lameness or ataxia to digestive symptoms with vomiting. And ultimately what often brings them to the veterinarian then is profuse, unstoppable bleeding, which will easily quickly lead to death. So here is an example here of a dog with nosebleeds, which is often the first thing that brings them into the vet. This disease affects all breeds but German shepherds are particularly sensitive. Here is another uh, image here showing you the diversity of the symptoms, again, making it hard to diagnose on site, but we know it is very, very common here in our uh, local populations. So we suspect it quite often in animals. How do we get this disease? All of us, animals or humans, we get it from tick bites. Uh, the tick has to be infected with a bacterium. So it has to have Ehrlichia or Anaplasma, which it got from a blood meal. Ticks have several blood meals throughout their life cycle that can take up to two or three years. And they eat on a host that has this bacterium and the next host they eat on, oops, they transmit it to. It's important to note that it takes 12 to 24 hours for the tick to transmit the bacterium. So if ticks are removed immediately, that can prevent transmission. In humans, the disease is very unspecific in its signs. Often at first, it's lethargy, lack of appetite, and just general unwellness. One can have joint pains, especially in anaplasma, but also diarrhea and or neurologic signs are observed. Bleeding disorders are also reported in human um, infection. And this disease, as said earlier, can be debilitating. The fatality rate in ehrlichiosis for humans is up to 1%. In anaplasmosis, it is a little uh, lower, but treatment is possible for this disease. It just needs to be suspected in order to be detected and tested for. So that brings me to the importance of your awareness of this disease being present, hence the reason for our little round of presentations here. How do we know we have it? In animals, as said earlier already, we suspect it quite commonly because we know it is very prevalent. There is a blood test and we have rapid tests. So within 10 to 15 minutes, we can be reasonably sure whether we have it or not. In humans, however, it is much more difficult and blood tests, again, are required. Yet, if they are not requested, then it will go undiagnosed and these tests reportedly also can take up to weeks to uh, come back with results. So the diagnosis in humans is not as easy and straightforward as it is in animals. Now we come to the most important part. How do we avoid this disease? 
in animals and always prevention is best. And in this case, animals uh, to prevent tick infestation on our animals with preventatives is probably the one most important thing that you can do. If you do find engorged ticks already, you may have to treat the environment as well, so your yard. The general recommendation is to check your dogs every day and to remove all ticks thoroughly. And of course, avoid for them to even roam in these bushes. Once the disease was acquired, uh, you will need a veterinary exam and prescription of antibiotics to control the disease. Prevention in the environment is equally as important as on the animals. If you have ticks in your yard, keeping the grass short helps to keep the populations of uh, ticks under control because they climb up on bushes to then uh, jump onto their host. And there are uh, treatments that you can do to your yard to eliminate the ticks. In humans, the prevention focuses again on preventing to get bit by not going into areas infested with ticks and or treating your clothes with tick repellents removing any ticks daily immediately so that they don't embed for long and if you have been exposed and are experiencing any symptoms then you should as always seek advice from your family physician and mention that you have had ticks and that you are concerned about tick-borne diseases. So to end here some further information and references with links to where this information was taken from, from the CDC, as well as this manual here from the CDC on diagnosis and management of these diseases. As mentioned, it is underdiagnosed. It needs to be suspected. People need to be aware of it more in order to keep us humans safe. And the most efficient way to eliminate ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis for ourselves is treating our animals. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this talk helpful. Please let us know of any questions. Check out the Wildlife Ambassador Program and feel free to suggest any future zoonosis or One Health talks of your interest.